I'm Mo Kelly, and this is iHeart Wellness. Dr. Abbas Ardahali is a professor of surgery and medicine in the Division of Cardiac Surgery at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and holds the William E. Connor Endowed Chair in Cardiothoracic Transplantation at UCLA. Dr. Ardahali also serves as the director of the UCLA Heart, Lung, and Heart Lung Transplant Programs, the largest heart and lung transplant program in the United States. He is a pioneer in the field of heart and lung transplantation. It's my pleasure. Dr. Ardahali, it is good to see you. How are are you today? Very well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. April, of course, is National Donate Life Month, but also this is the 40th anniversary of heart transplantation at UCLA. Tell me about heart plant transplantation in 1984 versus 2024. Well, when we started doing heart transplantation, the field was very different. We did not know as much as what we do know now mm -hmm. and the expectation for patients' survival after heart transplantation was not what it is today. At that time, it was expected that about one out of every three patients may not survive mm -hmm. to actually leave the hospital. Right now, it's expected that 98% of the patients survive the operation and leave the hospital with a working heart. Is there something specific? Is it, is it technological advance? Is it procedural advances? Surgeons getting better? Is it all of that or, or is it something else? It's all of the above. Mm -hmm. Many things have improved. We know now that how to manage the patients better. Mm -hmm. The medications are better. We also know how to manage the donor organs are better. So all around, everything about heart transplantation has improved, and we're only at the beginning. I expect mm -hmm. this to continue to improve over the years to come. Viability of an organ outside the body this is something which has improved over the years. I've been reading up on it, but you obviously know this better than me. How has that particular portion of the science changed and improved? Organ transplantation requires a, uh, a coordinated team so that we actually, as soon as we take the donor organs out, we go as fast as we can to put it into the recipient to do the transplant surgery because donor organs have a limited viability outside of the human body. And donor organs human organs were never meant to be on ice. But that's one, it's not one size fits all. Um, a heart is not necessarily as viable outside the body as maybe a kidney, or are they all the same? How would you describe that? That's correct, Mo. Um, the um, upper limit of the number of hours that a human heart can live outside of a human body without any perfusion or w on ice is about four to six hours. For liver, it's about eight hours. For human lungs, it probably is about the same. And for kidneys, maybe a little bit longer, maybe up to 24 mm -hmm. hours. And if it goes beyond that, the organ may not be viable, may not function. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason that we have a limited time to take the organ and then proceed with the transplantation as fast as possible in the middle of the night, on weekends and holidays. We have, there is no limitation. We have all the resources available so that we can do the operation as fast as possible. In a contemporary sense, I was going through COVID just like everyone else. We were in this unknown space in time and history, but it was during COVID that I actually learned that lung transplantation was a thing, as they say. How long has lung transplantation been a tool in a cardiothoracic surgeon's toolbox? Well, the first human uh, lung transplantation was performed in 1957. The first successful one was performed in about 1986 or so. So it's been only about 30 years or so when human lung transplantation has been part of the, the normal armamentarium in the field of medicine. Nonetheless, there has been significant strides in the, um, in the quality of the donor organs in, the, in terms of the outcome of patients who undergo lung transplantation in this country and beyond. It's not just having a viable organ, it's about matching donors and, and recipients, whereas there might be more viable organs available for a kidney transplant, for example. Uh, it's probably, there are fewer for hearts, isn't that correct? That's correct. How do you go about expanding that? Um, last year, there were uh, 16,000 consented donors in the United States, mm -hmm. of which only about 20 to 30 percent of them were, act, were good heart donors. Mm -hmm. Of those 16,000 donors, the vast majority were kidney donors. About 8,000 were liver donors. So the hearts and lungs are the organs that are um, of the nature that 
they are not as suitable for transplantation because of the limitation, because of the damage that occurs during brain death. We have a smaller number of potential suitable donors for heart and lung transplantation. Mm -hmm. As these organs are very sensitive to injury, and we have to take all the precautions necessary to make sure that these organs in the best possible shape so that they can be transplanted. I have a friend who is a heart transplant recipient, I have a friend, multiple friends, work here as a matter of fact, who have had kidney transplants. I know that there is an upper limit as far as the life of that organ, even though it's transplanted due to immunosuppressant uh, drugs and so forth. What is it with hearts? How long is that heart after the transplant? Is it viable usually in a successful transplantation? We have come a long way over the past 30 years. 30 years ago, the expected life expectancy of a heart transplant patient was in the order of about six or seven years. Now, we're talking about the median life expectancy of over 13 to 14 years. Mm -hmm. So it has doubled in a matter of a, over a period of about uh, 20 to 30 years. And we will continue to improve the outcome after heart transplantation in the years to come. I always wonder about <coughs> external stimuli. Are we as people, as Americans, world citizens, are we doing better by our hearts, by diet and exercise, or are you seeing more potential candidates because we are not taking our care of our hearts in the way that we should? As a general rule, um, everyone who stops smoking, everyone who exercises, everyone who engages in a good uh, normal diet mm -hmm. will do better for their heart. And I think that there is a national awareness of some of those practices. Mm -hmm. So I'm optimistic that over the course of the next decades, we will see some improvement in those. But there are other conditions that come about. For example, you mentioned the issue of COVID after mm -hmm. in, in the past few years. COVID was something that was unexpected, yet a lot of patients acquired COVID and through no fault of their own, and they had developed end-stage lung condition and needed lung transplantation. So those conditions that can come about and create um, end-stage heart and lung disease may occur and need organ transplantation. Since we keep mentioning COVID, I think it's, it's important in this conversation to see what more do we know about COVID now in terms of the long-term implications on the heart and the lungs. What do we know now that we didn't know maybe a year ago about COVID and its impact on our organs? There is better understanding of the long COVID syndrome, which means that patients who had previously acquired COVID a, few, a percentage of them we develop in this condition which has long-lasting impact on lungs and the heart. Mm -hmm. However, the vast majority of the patients who have acquired COVID will recover from this, just like any other viral infection. And so we are optimistic that with better understanding of the long COVID syndrome and development of better therapies, we can control even that condition. How are we doing around the world? And I mention that because you're from Tehran, Iran. You have a, a more worldly sense of this than I would. How is the world doing as it relates to cardiothoracic health? I think that in general, one of the, um, the caveats is that everyone is becoming more aware of it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, obesity is becoming a worldwide pandemic. So there are opposing factors that's impacting wellness in terms of heart and lung uh, function. Uh, but overall, I'm very optimistic that with greater awareness, with greater information being distributed amongst the patient, amongst the population, that the wellness is going to preside and, and pervade. I would love to get to know more about you as a person, beyond you as a physician. What is a good day? What is a bad day? It's, because it seems like the odds are always against you in what you do, or you would measure success in small increments, not necessarily long-term. Am I right? Pretty much. I think that a good day for me is a day that I have had a successful surgery, and a patient who is, who is in need of a life-saving uh, procedure is doing well in the ICU. When I go home, I'm very happy about that. It makes my day. Mm. A day that's not good is when a patient that I have operated on or uh, who is a patient of mine may have uh, suffered a complication. So unfortunately, everything that happens in my professional activity directly translates into how I feel as a person. Mm -hmm. And I consider myself a typical physician whose life is devoted to caring for others and this is a, a common phenomenon that occurs throughout this country with thousands of the physicians. Dr. Ardahali, I 
open my conversation with you remarking how you are a pioneer in this field. You've told us about where we were and kind of where we are right now, but where are we headed in a scientific sense and an understanding sense of these issues? When it comes to the field of organ transplantation, um, one, the two major challenges for the field is the organ donors mm -hmm. and our inability to get the do organ donors and make them better before transplantation. The second challenge for the field of organ transplantation is long-term durability of the human organs mm -hmm. because of rejection and other factors that comes into the equation. Um, when it comes to the um, scarcity of the donor organs, it, there is a new technology. There is an advance in the field that is very promising. By that I mean we currently take the human organs, stop the organs, be it either heart or lung or the liver, and put it on ice and then rush back and do the transplant. However, there is a, an, an idea that has um, tantalized the, the minds of many physicians over the past many decades, which is, what if we could actually take those human donor organs and keep the blood circulating through those organs, mm -hmm. such that mm -hmm. as far as the donor organ is concerned, it is still in a human body. It is not taken out. So it continues to function the lung continues to breathe, the heart continues to beat, the kidney continues to produce urine. Mm -hmm. If we can develop a technology that keeps these organs in a normal state, it gives us an opportunity to number one, so that we can match the donor organs mm -hmm. to the recipients. A recipient who is in Florida can get an organ from Hawaii because now we do not have to rush we have an organ that as far as the organ is concerned, it's still in a human body. No difference. The second part of the, the, the real advantage of this technology is that it gives us a platform to make changes in that donor organ. Just imagine, for example, if there is a risk of rejection. <coughs> rejection, it comes about because there are proteins that are different between the donor and the recipient. What if we can somehow mask those proteins? What if we can develop a donor organ while it's on a machine, while it's blood circulating through it, so that it doesn't express those proteins, so that it's recognized by the recipient as part of self? We take a diseased organ out and put an identical new organ that is recognized as part of you so it can live in you happily thereafter. 10 years away, 15 years away, or are we miles away? <coughs> I think that there are some improvements that we can see translatable to our daily practice mm -hmm. within the next five to 10 years. I think we are at a threshold in terms of seeing some incremental, some transformative changes in the field of organ transplantation mm -hmm. that we would look at this now and say that that is science fiction. As we did 30 years ago, mm -hmm. we said, how can you actually take another human heart, put it into another human being, and expect it to work? Mm -hmm. That was science fiction 40 years ago. And look where we are. It's being practiced virtually every day all across the world. Before I let you go, I just have one personal question. I am fascinated by what you do, how you do it, but also the when you do it. If you have um, a number of patients that you're monitoring and someone is up for a heart transplant, how do you manage your life with respect to someone who may be on an operating table in a 12-hour period? That always takes precedence. And I think you need to speak to my wife to see what the, <laughs> the real impact of that has been. The first breathing lung transplant in this country was performed on my daughter's sweet 16th birthday. Mm. I missed that. However, I think that about a month later at a meeting, that same patient came up to my daughter and said, guess what? I'm here because your dad performed this. And, I, and he told me that and I, I, I had no regrets. I, I mentioned to him that, you know, I missed my, my daughter's 16th birthday. Mm -hmm. But she will never forget this. She'll always remember this. And the patient will always remember this. 
And I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to have done that. And I would do it any day. And I think my daughter understands it. Well, I think that is a perfect place to end our conversation. I salute you, Dr. Arda Holly. I salute what you do and also the advancements that you're helping bring to this field. I'm Mo Kelly, and this is iHeart Wellness.